I just want to say welcome to this session and the second in a series of Meet the Hub webinars. And tonight um, we've got Lynn from Good Food Extra joining us to talk about this amazing food enterprise and everything that they've been doing over the last year since they started and all of the lessons that they've learned and yeah, sharing their experiences with us tonight. So I want to say a massive thank you to you, Lynn. And it'd be great if you could start off by telling us a little bit about Good Food Extra. Um, sure. And can I encourage, as we're such a small group, can I encourage people to just interrupt and ask questions on chat or whatever? Because the last thing I want to do is waffle on. I'm terribly excited to be talking to Canada and Ireland. That just feels really inspiring, actually. So we have a funny story and it's a kind of don't do what we did in a way. We set up Good Food Exeter in an absolute wing and a prayer way. It wasn't set up um, as we, we set up an online farmer's market under the name Good Food Extra, which is the name of our not-for-profit community benefit society. And we did it in a, we were halfway through a different project, which was to set up and run community markets through a charity that I'm also a trustee of. And COVID came and cutting a very long story short, we just thought, well, we've, we've talked to all these producers, we have found all this energy and excitement about linking local people in Exeter with sustainable local producers let's try an online farmers market and we were encouraged by a, a nearby similar operation in Cornwall who are um, Tamar Grow Local and I you know I, I have to say semi-jokingly they led us on and completely misled us by saying it was all terribly easy <laughs> and if we knew then what we knew now we would never have done it so it, it, this is a this is a very unvarnished, truthful version, you know, and also um, we still don't know if we're going to make it. So this isn't like we are successful, rah, rah. This is very much I want to pick out the bones of what I would say to someone who was thinking of doing something like this, I guess. And what's worked and what hasn't and why and what our reflections are. And basically, it's very simple. We are you can see our. OFN page like everyone else we sell local produce uh, it all arrives into a place in Exeter High Street which we get for nothing from a from a fellow charity and we volunteers largely pack and it's distributed out either by delivery or people can collect from a couple of places so it that's the model and we're not breaking even We've had some successes. It's 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 definitely a roller coaster story, but that's that's the backdrop. So, I mean, does anyone want to just ask anything to understand the basics of what we are before I go any further, or does that raise any questions? No, no. Okay. So, Carly asked me. As Carly, no, wrong. Kaylee, too many K's. Kaylee asked me to do a quick week in the life, just what it's, oh, good. Thank you, Louise. Um, shall I just do that then, a quick week in the, like what it feels like and looks like to be doing this? Right, so how it feels and looks is that, I think it's important to understand the, pers the personnel side because that's so vital. There are three unpaid directors who set up Good Food Exeter, me and two colleagues. They work full time. And I am a, I'm retired, but a very busy activist with other stuff I do. And that's part of the first thing I'd say, you know, we we set it up thinking we weren't going to be doing anything except hovering in the background and making it all happen. And that's not possible. You have to have people who would just want to give their blood and guts to make it their business, their social enterprise. That's my view. Um, so. Then we we took on the brilliant Julie Smith, who's absolutely fantastic. We'd already been using her for our, to work for our charity. And we took her on as a, a day rate consultant or an hourly rate consultant, which I, I think was a brilliant move. We could never have done it if we'd had the worry of a permanent employee, actually. The whole essence of what we've done is we've been totally light. We have no premises, no staff, no commitments. I think the only thing we're committed to is an insurance policy because we had to have that like public liability. And that is a massive strength. And I definitely recommend that foot, look, footloose approach to start with. So there's the three of us, the directors and Julie, who gets money, not much. This is how the week looks. 
I'm good. Our market runs, our online market for customers runs Saturday to tomorrow morning at 9.30. So after this call, you can have a quick look and you can see what we're selling. But at 9.30 tomorrow, along with all most other OFN sites, we close Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. First lesson is that's too many days to close. But we did it to fit in with Tamar Grow Local because some of the products we wanted, we could only get from people, not just Tamar to be fair, some products that we saw as core and important and valuable, we could only get from people who couldn't fit in with any schedule other than delivering to us on Thursday. So the other lesson there is, there's a very complicated logistics about who can get delivery to you when, when you're doing your packing if you don't have permanent premises you haven't got lots of places to leave cold food it's so so that's the next lesson so we're starting on saturday the market opens uh, on ofn and we send out a customer newsletter that a certain kaylee advised us on and that was an absolutely fantastic thing we did that we wouldn't have done without kaylee Kaylee's expert knowledge and advice so we do a customer newsletter and again you can um, if you send if you want me to I can send you the link so you can read all of them there's a or Kaylee can there's a Facebook you know that Kaylee showed me as well there's a special link I can send you so you can see all our newsletters or you can just sign up to our newsletter out of interest and we produce a weekly customer newsletter. There's, we had lots of discussions, including with Kaylee, about what day to send it out. But we send it out at the beginning of the market cycle. And then I sit and spend a bit of time and do some Facebook posts on Saturday, sharing posts into groups I've joined, like, you know, mainly local neighborhood Facebook groups, which has definitely been very worthwhile, but it's faffy. So that's so then the market runs and we try and manage our Facebook stuff so that on, you know, the days we're open, we're doing posts that are, are with a link to selling. And then the week, the days we're closed, we try and do Facebook posts and things. And this is all Kaylee's excellent advice. We try and do more posts that are just about general interest and bigging up other people and just picking interesting little stories. On Wednesday, Julie, as the paid responsible person, does all the backroom work, which I won't, I don't even know what it is. And but you know, it's the telling the producers what their orders are, telling the customers what their orders are, and all of that. And then on Friday, on Thursday and Friday, the food arrives at the premises we have for nothing and we pack. And then um Sometimes on Friday, sometimes over the weekend, and then always on Monday, there is almost always stuff to sort out from that last market, mistakes, things like that. And that is amazingly time consuming. And we've just, you know, and then there's another set of mistakes and issues that come up, which is between you and the producers. So to give you an example today, I just authorised two payments, both of which for around 250, 250 pounds for two suppliers but that those orders went back weeks and weeks and there'd been a mistake in what they'd invoiced or they'd forgotten or so the 250 pounds to the coffee company we sell about two packets of their coffee every week so you can imagine what had gone wrong that we had to pay them 250 pounds backlog so that the admin is huge and pernickety and demanding and really, that is, that's the week. Um, that's the logistics of a week. Yeah. Does that make any sort of sense? Yeah, thank you for that. I think it's really interesting to see things kind of laid out that clearly of what you do and when. Um, and I just want to say, I've got the link at, um, for all of your newsletters here, which I've just shared in the chat. Oh, anyone. fantastic. That's great. How efficient of you. That's really well. So I think that's quite a nice example of, of, um, of newsletters. So yeah, so thanks for sharing the week. It sounds like you, did it, do you feel like it took you a while to kind of get into that groove of how and when you do things? Or oh yeah. That... Oh, and it's continually, I, I mean, my other, you know, tip is you just have to be continually reviewing and adjusting you, you know, you, it, it, this is such an emergent kind of thing. So, I mean, can, can I just pick out a couple of things that 
lessons learned maybe shall I go to that to just cut to the juicy some of the juicy stuff I mean yeah. definitely if I was if I was advising me now apart from what I've already said about I honestly think this has to be the structure of a set of people up here who are unpaid directors and the people doing it I don't think works unless the people there has to be some real commitment and passion maybe anyway that's just what I think but some lessons learned right the bad news for us in Exeter we're starting to wonder if being in a city the size of Exeter is a downside because there are more places to buy sustainable local food in Exeter than some of the other hubs around us that are based in rural parts of Devon where it's harder to get to specialist shops I guess that's just a hypothesis no one can prove any of this but we do feel slightly, you know, we've got a farmer's market. There's a sustainable food shop. Um, and I just heard, Kayla, you might have heard about this, but there's this new company with a weird name like The Good 60 or something. Have you heard of them? Yeah, do they, yeah, do they do, um, they kind of go around local shops and they then do deliveries on bike. Is that the... Well, no, model? they're doing exactly what we're doing, but with tons more money and resource. And they have been approaching some of our producers asking if they want to sign up because they want to start an operation in Exeter. So it, there's a very, conf I, I feel really confused and conflicted, okay? It feels to me as though there's two threads going on for us here anyway. One is... Yes, definitely strong interest in local sustainable food, growing interest in local sustainable food. Yes, some small producers really struggle to have any kind of coherent outreach to a market. But we, I think that that assumption has been quite roundly challenged. And uh, uh, the one about that the producers, small producers are really struggling to meet, meet a market. I think they've got better and better at that. And, and the facts from our end are we've lost at least four really good suppliers that we would love to have on the market and that we had on the market. And we've lost them all because actually since we first started planning our launch in around February or March last year to when we launched in May and onwards, over those first few months, they all just became better and better at selling directly themselves, basically through local farmers markets and Facebook and their website. And one after the other, they went, I mean, no, it's more than four. We lost two vegetable suppliers, a fantastic meat supplier. I met other suppliers who said, you know what, it's great, but actually we're doing just fine. We don't need to, we can't really sell anymore and we don't want to sell anymore. And just last week, we're trying to get a vegan deli in Exeter that make all their own vegan produce. And the vegans are just like hysterical about how wonderful it all is. They've just said no. They said yes. And then they went, you know what? We just haven't got the capacity. So these small producers have got their own limits of what they can produce. And the minute they can sell it all themselves, you know, so I, I think that's a, a national or possibly international, I have no idea, issue to think about. And so I'd say if you're thinking of a food hub or you're reviewing your food hub, the most vital thing is to find out who really wants to sell through you. And who's motivated to sell through you? Because if they're not, you're you're on a hiding to nothing. So you know, so yeah, that that's been a, that's been the biggest surprise that we've spent more time scrabbling around looking for people to sell their stuff. And we are very strict. I mean, that's the other thing. I think you have to decide. And I really hope I'm not telling anyone to suck eggs here. But you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how strict we were going to be. And we are fairly strict. We don't say organic, but we do say we personally check and we ask questions. And if there's not something fairly significantly good they're doing in terms of sustainability and animal welfare, then we it's not enough to say I make lovely cakes in my kitchen. We want them to say I make lovely cakes and all the eggs are definitely free range at least. I mean, as a minimum, for example. And we have turned some people away who just like there was a woman who wanted to do speciality chocolate and she did make it all in her house. But there was nothing about the chocolate that had any sustainability credentials at all. So we we said, no, that's just us. You know, every, but what I'm saying is everyone's got to I think you will. I think you do have to draw your own lines fairly clearly, especially because it's such a mess with labeling. And we've got people 
who say, and I believe them, that they are a higher environmental standard than organic, but they haven't got a single label. But when you meet them and you see what they're doing, you don't doubt it. Yeah, and I think that's a really, like, I guess it's a really interesting thing, isn't it, to have a completely values-led food enterprise where you have your kind of core values that you stick by and then that how that then makes things more complicated if you're looking for, so, or if you're in the position to be looking for suppliers. And I think that's really interesting um, what you said about actually that you didn't expect to be searching for suppliers, that you felt that you'd probably, uh, and I'd be interested to know actually for anyone who's joining us from Canada and Ireland, if you have noticed that with any of your, um, in your enterprises or with enterprises that you work with. Um, yeah, everything um, Lynn said it sounds very familiar to, I'm in Canada in a small town that's very rural and farm area all around, but we struggle with keeping small suppliers because mostly it's just, um, they don't have the capacity to, we, we're a farmer's market too, so we have in-person sales and then we recently, because of COVID, started the online but it's really hard to get the vendors or the suppliers to commit to coming. So one thing is, is the online has allowed some more vendors, we call them vendors, but suppliers to participate because for them it's less, a little bit less investment of time because they can just drop off product instead of staying and, you know, for four hours investment of setting up at a farmer's market. That's like been one um, experience we've had with the online. I guess the other thing that Lynn said is that uh, we also try to draw the, some boundaries about what the suppliers do, like, you know, make sure that they're producing their own products is basically, we're kind of strict about that. And, and it just lately, it's been hard to, you know, find <laughs> and keep those suppliers um, so you have a good diversity of products, which in turn leads to what kind of customers you're going to have. If you lose, start losing, it's like a snowball effect, then you lose the customers. <laughs> so then you can't attract the suppliers. It's like a <laughs> feedback. Um, so it was I mean, interesting that, yeah. to hear the similar experience. I, th I think the other thing on, you know, the, well, the other absolutely, you know, the thing that has oh, several things there pricing and who your market is okay just talk about that a little bit we really set we set up good food exeter believing we always knew we'd have to start focusing on what we call in britain the guardian readers meaning the people you i don't know what the canadian equivalent is but the people you know are will pay over the price for for quality sustainable food and are driven by value so they will spend double on an organic chicken right the sort of the guardian readers but we we did we we had two beliefs we thought one we can draw other people in who will make a switch to sustainable food for a few items and two we also thought goodness me if we're getting completely free premises and all these volunteers we're going to be able to get the price of organic food or sustainable food quite down we're going to make it more affordable to more people well people we so haven't most of the time we struggle to beat waitrose organic prices and that's with an, all these freebies going on you know and grants and everything and that i find that profoundly depressing actually but it is a very you know that is a reality we're working with and so we've had to yeah, you know, that that so I'm linking that to the another issue that if the people buying your food are largely people who are a really quite foody and or b really care about provenance and ethics and everything, then you actually have to have quite an appetizing and interesting array of producers. OK, because if I go to extra farmers market or online farmers market and there's like, you know, one cut of beef and a, a lamb chop and two pipes of vegetable, it's absolutely not enticing. And I've the other thing I think we've learned backwards, we've learned it by trial and error is the more products you've got, the better. You need to have range because that's the way you pick up 
extra sales. So we've got in, I, I would like to have more health and cosmetic and not health, but you know, cosmetic and beauty. We've got some fabulous things like soap made with tallow from beef where from a place that does, you know, the whole thing is we use everything. We use the whole animal. We don't waste anything and things like that. Yeah. So th there's just a lot of conundrums that you're juggling with. I, I mean, any other, yeah, any other ask. questions or? I was just curious about how many orders you on average have. Yeah, like yeah, good question. Tamar Grow Local, who were like, have been our mentors, the other, the lo other local hub, they, they, they told us that 30 was completely, you know, you'd have a nervous breakdown if you've got 30 orders. But what we found actually, and this is another really interesting learning point, it isn't really the number of orders, it's the size of the orders. So another thing that's happened is the, the average price of, our, of a, a custom order has gone down and down and down. So ironically, we're doing quite well, I think, at drawing in these people who are not the usual suspects, people who are willing to have a bit of a go. But those people, they're putting in orders for like two items for six quid. And then they come and collect it, you know, from the because we have a, you can come and collect on Friday. So we can have 25 orders, many of which are less than 10 pounds. I just put in my order and it was 75 pounds because I and basically this is the other really interesting thing. There's so many interesting things. If you get people ordering dairy, especially cheese, meat and fish, you're going to do better. Because the sheer, you know, if you think uh, if you think that, you know, we're getting 25 P in the pound, then it takes a lot, a lot of potatoes and vegetables to reach. We, we, we know that we know we have to take around one thousand six hundred pounds a week. That's what we think we have to take to even break even. OK, and our best ever week was one thousand four hundred and we did lots of one thousand weeks. And now we're dropping right back down to seven, eight, nine hundred. And that's also partly because of Hungry Gap, because we've got less stuff on the market. But I, I'm also and this is a really interesting one to throw out there. I do really wonder that there seems to me to be such a burgeoning thing of vegetarianism and veganism now. It seems to be so growing that fewer you know i think if you're a meat eater or you want to buy sustainably sourced fish we are a great place to be we've got an amazing offer but you've got to be quite keen on eating meat and fish and not just that to be interested in i could buy an organic chicken carcass and a pig's trotter on the market today right now if you like cooking that's just joy you can make the best stock in the world but the number of people with those interests and skills, I think, are diminishing all the time. And it's being diminished even more by how many people are vegetarian and vegan. So that's, an, you know, and that then and if more of your customers are vegetarian and, you know, that the other thing is, do you have veg boxes in Ireland and Canada? Do you have the a veg box schemes? Is that common or not? Yeah, there's people with like CSA boxes meat. yeah that sort of thing so yeah. that's the other thing we keep meeting people who say i'd really like to support you but i already get my veg box from organic farmer blogs and actually that's enough for me and so that's another thing about this there is there are too many people competing for the sustainable local food dollar i think yeah Lynn. Yeah. I had some ideas just based on what you're talking about, because yeah. I've heard that um, Lynn, my colleague, has talked quite a bit uh, to other people and um, she's done a, a fair bit of research. First of all, going to the one you've just said about um, the veg box things. I don't know whether is there one predominant veg box supplier in your um, area, um, one place where most of your customers say get their veg boxes from? I think there's two okay because it might be worth like see if you could partner with them he's on um, no the main one is on our market no i don't mean necessarily have it on your market but uh sell um some hubs 
what they do is that they, they don't actually offer the veg box themselves, but they offer it, um, their producers like a, a top up to the veg box. So um, people will want the veg box each week and they'll get it from Mr. X or whatever. But if you um, can get Mr. X on OFM, by the sound of it, you have got him on OFM, then they can have a shop front and you can um, supply them as it were. And so uh, when they deliver their veg box, if someone wants a pint of milk that week, they can buy their pint of milk through Good Food Exeter and um, you get something from it as well. Uh, but the customer gets everything in one go. So um, you mean that the veg box scheme comes via our shop as well? They'd have yeah, to switch the veg do. box scheme to us. I think the thing is, what's in it for them? If they're running a successful veg box scheme themselves, why would they take? Why would they give us lose commission through selling through us? You see. Or what you could do is that you offer them, uh, like, you offer yourself as a top up to their customers. So their customers, um, they say to them, well, if you want a. Um, like something bespoke extra this week you you can get it from good food exeter and you get it all delivered in one go does that make sense yeah but only not really because they're running such a different operation what's in it for them to say that i mean it's interesting your broader point about what well, one of the things we've been really disappointed about i have to be careful how i say this Mo on the whole, I'm being very, ca I'm, I'm caricaturing a bit, right? But on the whole, most of our producers are, are appalling, <laughs> appalling at marketing themselves through us. We beg them to send us videos, to share things. And I think some of them, you see, most of our producers are, I think, in fact, all, every single one of them, of course, are selling themselves. They're selling directly in various ways, right? And I think they feel quite conflicted sometimes about um, selling through us or, you know, pushing stuff through themselves as we do the other way around. So it is quite a complicated relationship. And if they're on a very small margin and they're going to sell 10 lamb chops, if they can sell all 10 lamb chops themselves directly, this comes back to what's the need, you know, but from the producer's point of view. What's the fit you can offer? So I think some of the stuff you're saying is really interesting. And I do think that's an area for creative thinking. But I think it comes back to going back to first principles and saying, what actually is the problem for different people and how can you fix that problem? Can I tell you a quick story that I literally got last Friday? We've got this fantastic couple growing veg right on the edge of the city. You know, they're like half a mile from the city edge and they're just growing this fantastic veg and he was saying to me the other day they're absolutely typical of all the things I'm saying they're just hanging on in there they do it out of passion and love they sell some stuff through us and they are trying to build up their own veg box scheme and all that you know and they run a little come and pick up market and he was saying to me the truth is what I want to do is grow veg he said if good food exeter could grow to the point that I, and I think this is really significant because you're almost creeping into CSA type country now, right? He said, what I'd love is if we knew and could guarantee close enough that you were going to sell X amount of stuff for us regularly, we would stop selling directly. We don't want to sell directly. We want to grow veg. And he said, you'd be the perfect fit for us. And I just thought that was really, really interesting because, of course, we're in a continual chicken and egg where we're not breaking even. So they know that they can't rely on us but then they don't supply us with enough stuff because they're selling their own stuff so we're kind of all teetering on the edge of something and I have this increasing feeling that is there something you could do together but you have to cover the dangerous uncertain time because for people for whom it's you know if we stop good food exeter tomorrow nobody's going to go hungry but the producers it's their living live Another thing that's come to mind is that um, I worked for a small business a long a while ago, and I, I understand that as a small business, if you're if you are only able to get a production um, to it's uh, you've only got your capacity to meet your own need, uh, own sales, and you don't sell through anything else. But as a small business business grows and it becomes um, needs to 
uh, raise more revenue and it has more capacity, it often needs to sell through um, like farm shops or uh, people who have dairies, I know a local dairy near here, and they'll actually sell to like the main milk tanker. And they get peanuts if they sell through that. And if an alternative way of selling wholesale, whereas it, normal wholesale is sort of like 50% um, maybe of retail or even less for dairy is, is tiny. If they can get um, sort of 80% of retail price through a food hub, it suits them better. And it's a bit like the concept of why do um, in normal times pre-COVID, a lot of these, a lot of food producers go to uh, food festivals and stuff. If you've ever tried to go to a food festival, you know that it costs you like mm -hmm. an arm and a leg and you probably won't break even on the day once you've taken in wages, et cetera, as a small producer. But it's to do with advertising. It, not just advertising but if you if you get your word out there as a small producer and you sell through a food hub and it it, it is a there are a lot of advantages to, for them but obviously it, they have to be at the right stage themselves so perhaps the people you've looked at so far are just that little bit too small um mm, mm. and that and then going back to something else that you said um, a, a while back, um, you said that the average basket spend is decreasing at the moment, mm. but you're still maintaining a healthy um, sort of healthy customer numbers. But that actually, I'd see that as a positive I, I, and not take that entirely as a negative because um, you have to invest so much more time to get someone to buy through your shop front um, than it does um, than it does just to maintain that customer relationship. So if the fact that you haven't um, these people haven't dropped off is probably might be indicative of the fact that a the hungry gap and b we're all going through a bit more of an uncertain period and it's. Um, it's not that seasonal time of year, but if you can maintain these customers and you've still got those 25 customers coming up to the autumn and you're going into the Christmas period, then that's that's when you're gonna um, yeah. have the potential. If, well, if I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that you're pointing here is, is something like, you know, I touched on at the beginning. I don't think we're going to make it personally. I, I don't think we're going to make it because we will run out of money. In, I, I've, I think, you know, look, at, most people will tell you if you start any new small business, you should expect to lose money for a year. And most business plans factor that in. Right. So we don't have that. We've got we've got some money in our account that we've somehow managed to amass through bits and bobs and grants and God knows what. And we're just spending it now. And, and when that money runs out, we'll have to stop. So we are trying to get through, you're right about this is, I mean, apparently um, Kaylee can tell us that this is true, but Julie said she's talked to other people and people are all finding this quite a difficult time, like similar hubs, you know. Um, but we're on a kind of race to can we keep it going? Um, and also keeping it going means a next level of complexity because none of the directors want to go on putting in the amount of time we've been putting in. Like I've already cut down the time I'm spending doing Facebook and things because I've just said, look, this is my limit now. You know, we we set it up. Not it's like we feel we've acquired a baby that we didn't quite sign up for. And so we've all been very upfront with each other about that, you know. But um, I think you're you're pointing out that you do need time, but time in an unsuccessful business when you're not breaking even, you know, if you're losing three, four hundred pounds every week, you don't have a lot of time. So I'm just being honest about that. It's um, it's a, it's fairly brutal, you know. In fact, we already stopped once. I should have said that we launched in May last year and we stopped at the end of August because we could already see the model we were using wasn't working. So we stopped. We reviewed. We talked to Kaylee, and we decided to give it a second go, making some changes, which have helped definitely. But, you know, the question that's out for the jury is, is it simply an unsustainable model at this time in Exeter? 
or, or, or you know, is it, do we have to do, I mean, another little nice thing, another, you know, typical tiny, tiny micro business couple doing aquaponics, they want to put on courses where they are with their, about growing in polytunnels and aquaponics, and they want to sell the courses through us, which is fantastic. All we have to do is put the course up and every time they sell a, a place on the course, we get some money. And again, I think that's, those are the sort of, there's these different ways of looking at it that I think we've all got to be, you know, we need creativity and really being open to saying with this vehicle, what else can you do? And not be too stuck in a, it's just, we only sell food, you know, could, could we sell well, certainly selling courses on growing and anything to do that is, is, is a no brainer, isn't it? If somebody wants to do that anyway. Yeah. But I do hear what you're saying, Louise. It's just, we haven't got time. Well, yeah. I, I doubt we will last till the autumn. Who, um, who, who gets the most sales at the moment? Who would have the most to lose if the food hub did stop? Could you get them to take over some of the admin or some of the costs or, I like these aquaponics people. They're all, everybody's run off their feet. That's, that's my, I mean, that's my feeling. You know, they're all struggling to just get by. Um, and you actually have to have, as you, all of you OFN people know that are more experienced with OFN, not just anybody can manage OFN and do all the nerdy admin stuff. It's quite a, I wouldn't be able to do it. I'd be rubbish at it. So, you know. And it's quite painstaking work and it involves money and customers getting upset and keeping customers happy. It's quite skilled, I think. But yeah, so I don't. And that would be more of a cooperative enterprise then, really, wouldn't it? You know, but it's a good question. Who's got the most to lose? And this is the awful thing, you see. I mean, if we if we folded tomorrow, it wouldn't make that much of a difference to anyone. And I think that's that in there you have the answer to why it's not working it's like we are icing on an okay kind of a cake for for some of our producers i think but i don't think we're a lifeline and we thought we would be a lifeline i think i think we thought they were having such trouble selling but it is a more complicated story than that i'm depressing myself now people <laughs> I think in, in another sense, though, if if in your area, small producers are thriving in the sense that they are doing OK, then it's um, maybe, as you said, the need isn't there mm. at the current state. Um, but that's probably a positive thing because they, they yeah. are getting enough. It's not that you don't have the small producers. It, it, and the, the, and that they're not getting the sales. Um, it's just that the the whole um, collecting it all in one go or one place location shopping model isn't perhaps feasible. Um, I mean, that's the difference between a food hub and me going to, um, you know, the bakers plus the butchers plus the green grocers. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, there is, and there is another thing, and, you know, J Julie and I were just talking about this the other day. The truth is you have got to be quite a determined customer to shop with us every week. And the example would be, you know, I'm in Waitrose. I found myself in Waitrose thinking, oh, I could, I just need those, that tin of tomatoes. And I think, well, I mustn't buy it from Waitrose. I must wait and order it from, from Good Food Exeter. Um, or you see something that's reduced and you think, oh, organic leg of lamb in Waitrose reduced and I think oh I must have bought, you know but most people are not going to do that and there's the other complexity because of closing on a Wednesday morning you know if I was thinking on tomorrow at 11 o'clock some friends ring up and we arrange to get together for a nice meal at my house I can't it, it's all complicated because you don't you can't even look and see what will be on the market when it opens on Saturday and it's it's too late then you know so there's You've got to be very dedicated. You, 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 I think the people who are going to shop with us, you have to have a massive customer base because only a fraction of your customer base is going to shop with you every week. That's the conclusion I've come to. I don't know if that 
rings any bells, Kaylee, or other people have come to that view or um but it just feels like it's so specialist that you have to have more customers to cover all the times people are, you know, forget or away, ordered too much the week before and don't need anything the next week and so on. Do you do delivery? Yes, we do delivery by um, electric bike and electric car with a local not-for-profit. Okay. Three pounds. And that, again, that's been another surprise. I'm glad you asked that because we... When we relaunched, part of our relaunch was saying, OK, the drop model is never going to attract enough people. We have the only way this will fly is, is if we build delivery in. And to our amazement, very I would say roughly every week on average, um, half the customers pick up on a Friday afternoon between one and three and half the customers are delivery. And that really has surprised me for certain. I, you know, and it's again, we're not being able to prove our hypothesis that if you can reach more people further away from the city centre who don't want to come into the city centre, you will, they will buy and they don't mind paying. And we've even said, you know, you can have more than one household. You can three three households can order once and all go to one address, and then you can split the three pounds between you, one pound each. <laughs> But people just don't want to do it's too much it's too big a threshold to cross i think for a lot of people so the delivery is better yeah i i'm i'm intrigued by that by is the, the delivery system. always on a friday or can you yeah. have delivery at the weekend no. no it's only on a friday i'm just wondering whether like if i worked and i wanted delivery um and i was out i wouldn't want my expensive meat no. sat on the doorstep um, no, well, we say that if it's cold or chilled, they have to put out a cold box. But you're you're touching on another issue, which is the complexity of working out delivery, packing, and everything that the that the producers get the stuff in on a day that suits them. Most of the producers don't want to deliver on a Saturday, you see. So, um, and and when you know we 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 can only run one packing operation. It is an immensely complicated job. And for a small, not making a profit set up food hub, if you've got anything more than one packing session, I just don't know how you do it. Could you delay your packing session and have it and your collection and delivery a bit later on a Friday so it got to people's homes after work? You see, no, because we do bread and things like that. So if people, some of the deliveries come on, if you deliver milk on a Thursday, and it's not even being delivered to the customer to Saturday. That's too long a gap. That's one of the circles we've gone round. So, I mean, you're asking really good questions. And, and they're illustrating why it's difficult. I think it, it, it is good to kind of brainstorm. And it is good it to is. like... It to, is. It, like, even if it's highlighting all your problems, it, it kind of... Um... Yeah, no, it is. And I mean, the other thing is to do it the other way around and say only deal in frozen or only deal in food that doesn't have these because the delicate food salads edible flowers milk bread mushrooms they're the things that really you've got to deliver it the day after you get it from the producer much later than that is no good but if you ran a market that only had less fragile products that's another option and it would it would increase your possibilities for flexibility in the kind of in the way you're you're saying but then on the other hand you've got less choice you know <laughs> it for the customer I mean it's interesting our sustainable fish supplier and she also supplies a couple of the other hubs she has cracked she her her solution and why she's a sustainable fish supplier is she buys catch from small boats and it's all blast frozen immediately so she only deals in frozen fish everything is frozen and that means she could if there's lots and lots of mackerel today she'll catch them and freeze them and then she can sell them slowly and that's a very you know that's a very clever fix and we take it and then you know we can take advantage of that Thank you, Lynn. That was really interesting. I think also it's really good to hear that kind of um, back and forth between you and Louise. It was really uncovering some of the 
some of the very real issues that I'm sure other hubs are going to resonate with. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. When they watch this. And um, I think it's interesting when you were talking about the barriers that customers have to shopping with you, and one of them being this kind of complexity. And this is, I guess, one of the issues that, I guess, with the food system that we have in general, that, you know, there's been years and years of, of food being a kind of a convenience activity where people can go to a supermarket and get everything they want under one roof it's easy it's simple yeah. and they'll make it very easy with delivery any time of day so, yeah it's a really interesting problem a really interesting challenge that i guess there's no easy answer for but yeah it's i think the, con- the customer themselves like how is a yeah almost had this kind of cultural experiment of changing the way that we that we shop for food um so interesting challenge um i think that's right you are talking about it's like a cultural nudge thing you're trying to do to get people to buy from a farm an online food hub you know I mean, I do think, you know, we are also the enterprise that started during COVID and has only run during COVID. I think if a set of people were trying to do what we did at a different time and we could could expand into real markets, little community markets, that we're running a mini market this next week for the first time. We're, we're, we're running a tiny little mini market event with just three or four of the producers coming along with some special products, which we're billing, and they, and they are selling directly to the customers. So we won't make anything on it at all, but that doesn't matter. We are hoping we might gain one or two new customers who will come along, and if they can actually see the people, meet them, see the quality of the produce, then they might then go on the shop. So, you know, it, I, I'm also... Co- very much aware that we're doing everything in the most minimalist limited way both because of not having staff capacity and because of covid so you know i'd say a a cheerier view is like you know like louise said one cheery thing is in some ways the local producers here are doing quite well i think and another is maybe if you if you can combine an online farmer's market with a real market i do have a feeling that would draw in more people People, when we pack, right, we, we're in a lovely bakehouse that is part of a charity. So the people come in and buy their food right here in front of me. And we're just here packing our boxes about a meter away. And they all wander over and go, oh, that looks nice. Can I buy that? And we have to say, no, you can't. This is all pre-ordered and you give them the leaflet. But, you know, nine and a half out of 10 of them don't turn that into an action. But if they could have bought something there and then they would. And that, you know, that's the power of real markets, isn't it? We all know that. Is anyone else toying with, you know, live markets? Is that something any of you have thought about? Our our hub is uh, started out as a real market, but like I said, mentioned before, the challenge is, is the produce. It's a more of a time investment for producers and suppliers. So yeah, for some of them, it's harder. Yeah, because it is a small market. We're just a small like lake town basically that we have tourists it i feel like the in-person is more like a tourist experience thing like you know people come down because they want to do something and they come down to the farmer's market on a friday afternoon to walk around but i don't know if they're necessarily buying a lot i feel like the orders we get online are like people who shop regularly they want the local food and the online part gives us those customers the convenience to be able to get that good product every week but they don't necessarily don't have time to come down and shop at the market so i feel like they're kind of two different markets almost of customers yeah um, yeah that you're catering to so combined they kind of work because a lot of our producers do participate in both they come and drop their products we have volunteers over here packing them and then they go over there selling to people who just stop by so in that sense it does work well Mm. um i was curious lynn i i don't know if i can ask this but uh, Mm. how much your markup is because i've been struggling with what is fair to charge or the suppliers because i was trying to get some new producers recently and some of them said oh we're not you know 15 percent is too much and 
I don't yeah, know. No, I, I ought to know that, but I'm terrible at all that. I think it's um, 75, 25, I think. But yeah, you know, and yeah, I think we started as 80, 20, and then we changed it to 75, 25, because we just, we said, when we relaunched, we said, look, we just cannot, we did, we showed them the business plan and said, look, unless we increase the take a bit, it's not even worth starting again. So most of them were okay with it. Um, yeah. So but did yeah. they just raise their prices to the customer then, or or did they just? They, they, we, that's their choice. Yeah. Some of them did. It is funny though. The other thing about price. I mean, we know, uh, noticed the other day. You know, um, we're selling the same, exactly the same eggs as the local sustainable food store, and they're selling them for really significantly more than us. So, you know, it isn't always, it is really confusing about price because we've had lots of feedback of people saying, I love what you do, but it's too expensive. I can't afford it. You know, that's definitely a common thing. And we try to, that's why I try to do posts and things that keep kind of just saying, look, just get this, this one or two bits, just get this, just get potatoes or, you know, um, but you know what price being a barrier is definitely an issue but it's also a lot about what's the word packaging and assumptions isn't it I, I mean packaging in the sense of what people are buying for their money what they think they're buying oh we're nearly done aren't we Kaylee because I promised faithfully to stop at 6 30 <laughs> I'll be in big trouble because we've got visitors <laughs> no, and I was just going to say that's a really interesting point to land on, but we are coming up to time, probably have about 30 seconds left, so I just want to say a massive thank you Lynn for sharing so much tonight, including all of, not just the learnings, but the challenges as well, and I just know this is going to be really useful. Um, Good. For, for that could make it tonight, so. Well, thank you for running it, Kaylee. It's, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's great. I'm sure people will watch, you know, people watch these things who are thinking about doing it. You just don't know all the seeds that are being sown, do you? Exactly. So that's the thing as well. When you're starting, you just don't know what you don't know. So. No. <laughs> yeah. Big shout out to Tipperary in Canada. How exciting. <laughs> oh, there we go. I'm being, I'm being paged. <laughs> Um, thank you all right then cheers all thanks kaylee and i'll talk i'm seeing you tomorrow aren't i okay cheers then bye, bye.